you will know that in the end, it's that one individual. That one individual that has passion. That one individual that has fire in the belly. That one individual that's determined that something should be done. That is what the future for nature is all about. It's about empowering a new generation of activists. It's about taking those new ideas, new thinking, thinking outside the box, and take those ideas from the fringes of conservation back to the center. It's, it's us. Nature isn't something abstract that is out there. It is us. It is everything around us. We are the environment. And we all share this connection to the Earth. We're all part of the Earth. But only some will go to great lengths in order to protect and conserve the natural world that worries us so much at the moment. I just wish there were more foundations like the Future for Nature Foundation to recognize the contributions made by young people who work to make this world a better place for animals, for people and for the environment. The people behind the Future for Nature Foundation welcome you. Join us in this celebration of nature conservation. Well, hello friends, hello supporters of the wild. Welcome to the Future for Nature Awards. I'm Saba Douglas Hamilton, Chair of the International Selection Committee, and it's a real joy to be hosting this event today, live from Kenya. This is the second uh, virtual Future for Nature Award event, where for the next golden hour, we have the intense pleasure of honoring the remarkable achievements of our conservation heroes of 2021 and the endangered species they are fighting to protect. Monica with arboreal alligator lizards in Guatemala, Carolina Araya with hummingbirds in Chile, and Mohsen with rays and sharks in Iran. So thank you for joining us, and I truly hope that you are all healthy and safe. It's wonderful to be part of this growing human and animal Future for Nature family. And although we're spread around the globe, we do remain closely connected. So of course our thoughts have been very much with all those who have suffered during this difficult year, to whom we send all courage, strength and healing again now. The COVID pandemic has made humanity pause and challenged us to rethink our relationship with nature, really considering the profound consequences that will result from continued biodiversity loss and degradation of ecosystems. Because right now, as a species, we're in trouble. Carbon emissions appear to be going right back up to their awful normal. We're in the middle of a mass extinction crisis of our own making. And human pressure may push one million species to extinction in the next few years. Of course, as humanity eats into the wild, we continue to destroy the critical life support systems and carbon sinks, increasing also our exposure to zoonotic disease. Well, during these recent months of forced isolation, like many of you, I've been watching in wonder the sudden rush to explore the solar system with billions of dollars being spent on high-tech rovers to, um, from both America and China, now crawling across the surface of Mars, searching for alien life and inevitably setting a course for our future. Well, it just strikes me that human ingenuity is a funny thing, erupting suddenly and unexpectedly in strange places and going in strange directions. But I do really believe it's where much of our hope can lie. The same energy and inventiveness that gets us into space is exactly what we need to fix our problems back here on Earth. Vaccines used to take 10 years to develop. Now, faced with the COVID pandemic this last year, 15 different vaccines have been created and distributed in record time, with another 300 more on the way, promising light at the end of a long, dark tunnel. So when we put our minds to it, being it finding life on Mars or distributing essential vaccines through COVAX, anything is possible. And there are billions of dollars out there that could be used to sustain the unique diversity of animal and plant life on Earth if we make it so. Well, thank goodness, after a bit of a blip, global leadership is finally starting to focus properly on environmental threats, which of course is going to require extensive international coordination. 
no matter what our political differences are, we have no choice but to cooperate when it comes to saving the planet, because our common future affects us all. We need to alter our food systems, our economies and our societies to build the greener, more equitable, just and robustly biodiverse system that we know is possible. And this is exactly why people on the ground with their fingers on the pulse are so important. People like the young champions we are celebrating today that are passionate and practical, fizzing with ideas and energy and found most often knee deep in a swamp or on the trail of an obscure reptile getting the facts right. Our young heroes today are holding the line against extinction, literally being the difference for a species between life and death. And their ability to inspire local communities to take action or create groundswells of support can help sway the decision makers in power. By carrying the flag of integrity and decency into the wild, they are what all of humanity should aspire to be. So it is an absolute joy to be honoring their achievements today. Well, of course, none of this would be possible without the support of the amazing sponsors behind Future for Nature. The Fun Ho family of Burger Zoo, the Svanborn family of Africa's Eden, the Fudd family of the Fudd Foundation and the Van Weyerwerf Company. We are especially happy too this year that a new spon sponsor, Fondation Secre, has joined the Future for Nature mission. So thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. Needless to say, I continue to be blown away each year by the formidable efforts of a huge number of people who work behind the scenes. The Future for Nature Board, the Office, the National and International Selection Committees, the Board of Recommendation and the many volunteers who continue to magic this event into existence year after year. You are the best. Well, I can see that our audience has signed in from all across the globe. So please do take time to take part in the polls because we'd really love to know which continent you're on and what you care about. Later on, you can ask questions of our winners or comment in the chat, and we can all connect live at the end in the chat rooms. We also have these wonderful exposition hall where you can explore the field sites of many of our previous winners. And if you're watching the live stream, welcome. Do feel free to join us on the Hopin platform to make the most of this chance to connect with these wonderful young champions. Well, now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest, the superb wildlife photographer and conservationist, Franz Lanting, whose exquisite images of nature are second to none and have inspired so many of us. Franz. Greetings to all of you around the world from Santa Cruz, California. And my speciale groeten aan iedereen in Nederland. I'm delighted to join you for the Future for Nature Awards this year. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. I grew up near Rotterdam, where I saw nature give way to industry. And I became so concerned about the future of nature that I started studying environmental economics. But after I moved to California, I changed careers and I became a photographer. And ever since, my mission has been to show the dignity of animals in nature. I regard them as equals and I look at everyone as an individual. I aim to connect them with you through my images because we are not so far apart on the tree of life. But I also look at nature as a whole and what it means to us during a time of great changes. Everywhere I go, I see the alarming impacts on the Earth's ability to sustain us. Witnessing the Arctic ice melt in Greenland gave me shivers. Experiencing mega fires in California up close made the climate crisis a scary personal reality because we almost lost our own home due to a wildfire last year. It is hard to feel hopeful when you absorb all the bad news about the state of our planet. So what can any of us do about it? 
I believe one answer is right here. Behind me is a grove of ancient redwood trees close to where I live. They were first protected here many years ago by a small group of passionate nature lovers during a time when forests in this area were cut down to support California's economic boom. Thanks to those early conservationists, these giant trees are still standing today. Now people come from everywhere to see them. But just as important as the big trees are the seedlings around them. They are the future of the forest. I look at the Future for Nature Foundation as a forest community with big trees nurturing young ones. Each young tree is given a chance to grow so that they can thrive on their own ultimately, but they can also be stronger together. I consider every Future for Nature award winner to be a seedling in a global forest of wildlife conservation. And I thank each of you for your energy and for your commitment. Now, I'd like to say a few words to this year's winners. Monica, you are a savior for a creature that needs a champion. Lizards do not attract as many supporters as birds or mammals do. But I happen to love reptiles. I look at them as dragons in disguise, and I like to make them look monumental. That is what I did with this tuatara in New Zealand. I wanted to make people look at them differently. Monica, I wish you luck with your cause. Carolina, I hope you'll agree with me when I say that every hummingbird is a miracle in motion. I marvel when I see them in our own garden. But this one, I photographed in Brazil. Carolina, you are a big hero for a tiny hummingbird that needs one. I am thrilled that the Chilean wood stars energize you to create a brighter future for them. Martian, your country is unique. When I had a chance to do field work in Iran, I was struck by the depth of its intricate history but the diversity of its natural heritage is just as special. In Tehran, I photographed this wonderful tapestry, which blends culture with nature. It depicts the fabled Garden of Eden, which is described in the Bible. But the original concept for such a place of natural abundance actually came from ancient Persia. Yet Iran today, is not exactly a Garden of Eden anymore. Martian, you know that the creatures of the sea along the coast of Iran need relief from the pressures brought upon them. You have embraced an important mission and I salute you for it. Back to the forest one more time. Redwood trees can live for a long time. And in a mature redwood forest, you don't see a lot of young trees. But when a massive wildfire scorched a redwood forest near here, the trees responded to that shock in an unusual manner. They started growing great numbers of new shoots from their base. In response to the environmental crisis that we are faced with today, I would like to make a plea to all the big trees attending this event. Please emulate those redwood trees and do whatever you can to grow from your own base. Nurture more seedlings so that they can spread their roots and their branches in every direction to secure a future for nature. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Franz. That was just so beautiful. I loved seeing all your photographs and hearing your wonderful thoughts. Well, our first winner, Monica Torres, grew up in Guatemala City, where the steep, impassable ravines dissecting her urban neighborhood brought wild creatures on secret pathways right to her doorstep. 
As a child, she learned to catch small snakes and other reptiles, and encouraged by her parents' love and curiosity, soon became entranced by the natural world. Well, from an early age, she showed a passion for observation and a strong independent streak. So her decision to train as a biologist, though going completely against the grain, was as natural to her as breathing. Perhaps it wasn't her family's first choice of a career, but it was a moment of great significance for a small, critically endangered, arboreal dancing lizard, Abronia Cambelli. Hounded to death by local superstitions and critically threatened by habitat loss, this endemic alligator lizard was thought to be extinct until Monica rediscovered it in 2009. Well, since then, she stood up to illegal traffickers, worked tireless, tirelessly to demystify entrenched prejudice and expanded habitat by persuading traditional farmers to give over their land to create biological corridors. Just like the slow growing oak trees that are Abronia's favored habitat, Monica has realized that conservation is a long, slow process that requires a marathon runner. And her extraordinary levels of commitment, perseverance and persistence are testament to this fact, bringing Abronia successfully back from the brink of extinction. Monica, we applaud your efforts and we are so excited to be supporting this important work today. Let's now hear your story. Welcome. Today, I want to share with you my conservation story. It includes being a queen, machetes, and the power of the presence of a little girl. You see, love for nature, curiosity about wildlife, and passion to protect God's creation those are the things my soul is made of. I also had the privilege to grow up in a loving family, so I always knew I wanted to dedicate my life to conservation. This was so evident even when I was a little kid that my brother knew that all he had to do to make me stop crying was to recognize me as queen of all animals. Because even as a child, just the thought of protecting wildlife brought me so much joy. Even today, my family still uses this nickname from time to time. In 2009, I finally got my first job on the field. I had to check a list of species that were almost certainly extinct. Within this list was a small endemic lizard, Abronia Cambelli. So I started to gather all the information I could around this species, but I found little to no information about it. Farmers told me that they have never seen an animal like the one I was describing. And this makes sense because Adronia Cambelli lives on top of trees, so it's a very hard animal to see. On the other hand, local villagers knew exactly what I was talking about, and they reacted with a lot of fear. They believed that Abronia Cambelli had the power to kill people even from above the tree, so that at any encounter with one of them, they killed him. Within this context, I kept searching for Abronia Cambelli. After a few days and a lot of work, I finally saw it. Abronia Cambelli. There it was, this lizard, with modified scales in its head resembling a dragon, and a long, prehensile, monkey-like tail. It was love at first sight. And as you do with any new crush, well, you want to know everything about them. So I dedicated my efforts to discover the secret life of the rare and elusive Abronia Cambelli. During my field work trying to get to know Abronia Cambelli, I was approached by a few villagers. They told me that there was somebody else looking for the same exact animal as me. This led me to a house where I found a cage with Abronia lizards inside. That day I realized that besides habitat loss, Abronia Cambelli had another big threat, illegal traffic. In that house I met a guy, let's call him for safety reasons Juan. He was the guy that collected all the lizards for illegal pet trade. 
I started talking to him. I was explaining that this was an endangered species and that there were national law protecting it. And he was trying to explain to me that he had no idea about it and that he was only trying to provide for his family. As I kept talking to Juan and his brothers, I realized that I was surrounded by roughly 10 men that were holding kind of casually, but also a little too tight to their machetes. And the conversation only kept heating up. Suddenly, I saw a little girl peeking through the door. It was Juan's daughter. She was very curious about the animals in the cage, but she was also curious about the conversation we were having. I wasn't the only one that noticed her, and her presence had the power to change the energy in the entire room. We all got calmer, and we all just wanted to do the right thing. Eventually, we got and released all the animals into the wild even with the help of the guys that originally were holding to their machetes. I didn't know it back then, but that was the start of Project Conservation Abronia. Even today, Juan is a very important member of our conservation team. Twelve years after my first encounter with the species, I work with families, farms and communities to create biological corridors to protect, connect and expand the habitat for the species. I needed to do something to save the species from habitat loss, illegal traffic and fear-based killing. I was up for the challenge to turn the enemies into allies and the threats into conservation opportunities. I am a witness that this change is not only possible, but it has already started. With the Future for Nature Award, I will be able to take this project to the next level. When people ask me why I chose to work with this species and why I chose to face all these challenges, the answer is that it was never a choice. A world without Abronia Cambelli on it is inconceivable to me. Also recently, I became a mom to a beautiful baby girl. I'd want her to live in a world where Abronia Cambelli exists, along with a lot of other species. And who knows, maybe her presence will also have the power to change the destiny of another endangered species. Thank you, Monica, for that truly inspirational story. I still find it quite amazing that we're talking to you and you're in Guatemala. Well, now we move a little over on the continent to Chile to talk about the Chilean wood star or the Pica flor de Erica, which is the smallest hummingbird in Chile and the most critically endangered, eking out an existence in adverse conditions on the edge of the Atacama Desert. So it's somewhat befitting that its greatest champion is a child of that same desert, with the blood of the local Mapuche running through her veins, meaning the people of the earth in the indigenous language. Carolina Araya Sandoval began her conservation journey as a veterinary student, researching the life cycle of ticks on Gentoo penguins. But her heart soon brought her back to her home in Arica, where she threw herself into avian research and conservation, witnessing firsthand the heartbreaking vulnerability of the endemic picaflor hummingbird to the rapid agricultural expansion that was devastating its habitat. Carolina's clear-eyed solutions to protect and expand habitat, change agricultural practices, restore hummingbird feeding grounds and help meet the needs of the local people has turned around the fate of this tiny, exquisite bird, currently numbering only about 400 individuals. She's already committed the award money to buying a piece of land with a critical breeding stronghold she's just discovered. I have to say, I hope with 
all my heart that her dream of restoring the picaflor to its previous abundance, where they used to swarm like bees around flowers, will soon come true. Carolina, you are hugely deserving of this award, and we are absolutely thrilled to be honoring you today. Welcome to the stage. Hi, everybody. I would like to take you on a journey to the south of the Hummingbird continent, across the Andes mountain and into a long and narrow country called Chile. I want you to travel with me to northern Chile, the area that holds the driest desert in the world. The Atacama is surprisingly over half of the beer in the country. My hometown, Arica, is the northernmost city in coastal Chile, even though this land is on the edge of the driest desert in the world. It has a surprising diversity of ecosystems, from beaches and river estuaries to desert valleys like Asaba Valley and Camarones Valley. Seeing the change in the region in the fragility of the system made me realize how important conservation of these ecosystems is. The Picaflor de Arica, the Spanish name for the Chilean good star, was by far the most abundant hummingbird in the region. Hundreds of them used to fly around flower that has changed dramatically. Agriculture activity have increased in the dynamic on the valley have changed a lot in the last 20 years. The picaflor has, has vanished from the site where we had seen it before, and the area has become a garbage dump, with increasing number of people looking for jobs. This affect riparian habitat and has confined the picaflor to a couple of less impact valley. I learned at an early age that I want to work with animals in the natural environment. One of my favorite childhood memories was when I saw how a sparrow chick fell from its net while camping in the valley with my family. I still remember the adrenaline of having the responsibility of a life. So strong for having reached that moment and so fragile at the same time. I was only 10 years old then and I believe that that experience had a lot to wipe my decision to become a veterinary. It was in the Asapa Valley where I saw for the first time an energetic and territorial Pica Florderica. I feel in love with the beautiful, colorful, tiny, but at the same time strong creature. Sim the good start protecting a territory that was full or garbage and had recently been burned, but still keeping a tiring spirit and alternated his vital search for food and perching was devastating. It was that moment with that I decided to take the responsibility for the future of the species. I did not know how, but I decided to search for the tools and training to protect it. I found to the non-governmental organization Pica Florarica. I have assembled a local multidisciplinary team. It included school teacher agronomists that are interested in sustained production and my wonderful co-working, Ronnie Peredo, I renowned biology from our region and the community in general commit themselves to the mission of the organization. One of the hardest part of my job is to explain to my community the scenario that I have just described. You can still see other species of hummingbird around here, mainly Peruvian turtle and the Oasis hummingbird. Given that these two species are very similar to the Pica Florida, it has been difficult to raise awareness about the impact of our action of the Pica Florida habitat. It is difficult to explain that the hummingbird that bears the name of the city, Pica Florida, is the most difficult to spot. With the future for nature world, we, we plan to purchase a tract of land that is essential for the conservation of the Pica Florida This will allow us to actively manage the site and provide refuge 
where the species can persist. In the future, we will also build a permanent plant nursery on the site to grow the native plant that the picaflor use for food and nesting. We will continue our reforestation if forbidden its distribution range and expand our education project with the local school in the community. There is a saying that resonates with me, it said, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. We should all be aware of this and try our best to live the line the same or even better than we found it. We are all responsible for the conservation of wildlife. Everyone can make a difference. If you are passionate about uh, nature and species conservation, you can train all that passion for helping people understand the importance of biodiversity and ecosystem and how these are affected by our activity. After all, we all need nature to survive. Every effort comes, we can do it. Thank you Future for Nature for acknowledge our work. It will only make us work harder. Thank you, Carolina, for that wonderful rallying call. We are all with you, 100%. Now, there are some parts of the world that are hidden from us by a veil of misunderstanding, leaving us sadly ignorant of the state of the people, landscape, oceans, and wildlife. So we were all blown away to meet our final winner, Mozen Rezoi Atogolipur, who comes from Iran, and has dedicated his life to saying rays, saving rays and sharks in the Persian Gulf. Born into a military family, Mozin was the youngest of nine children, but with a gap of seven years between himself and his closest sibling, in essence, he grew up as an only child with the mini fauna of his backyard as his favorite playmates. His father was often absent, but when he did come home, he taught Mozin everything he knew about surviving in the wild, navigating by the stars, how to make sto fire from flintstones, and also took his son off to explore the wild riverbanks and gardens in the neighborhood. But it was the books left by his older siblings that really caught his imagination. Stories of alien creatures in the ocean, stingrays that could administer electric shocks and fish that could fly. It gave him a completely different perspective on his pet goldfish and sent him hurtling into the ocean at the age of 18, which was an absolute blessing for the marine world. His formidable work since then has put a spotlight on the critical status of rays and sharks along Iran's coast and is a beacon of hope now for Iran's marine species. We are so honoured to join hands with you, Mozin, and I, for one, promise to spread your, far, your story far and wide. Please come share it with us now. Welcome. I'm standing here next to the ocean, a picture that probably fits your image of me as a marine conservationist. For me, however, it is not so normal. Being born in the northeast of Iran, some 1,400 kilometers far from the coast, I had never seen the ocean before the age of 18. As a child, I mostly played alone in our backyard garden, where I loved to play with insects, animals, plants, and all kinds of living creatures in that tiny ecosystem. Soon after my family, especially my brother, understood my love to the nature, they started to bring me books about animals and plants, books that along with the nature around me shaped my worldview. 
Some of those books, those were about the life in the ocean. They had hair-rising stories about alien creatures that for me seem much similar to science fiction imaginary creatures. Stories about fish that can fly or mud skippers, fish that come out from the water and walk on the ground. Where is the ocean? Where that wonderland is placed? Can I see those bizarre species someday? These were questions that I grew up with them and shaped my dream for being a marine biologist. Finally, my childhood dreams came true. And I moved here to the southern coast of Iran to study marine biology when I was 18. And since that time, I never lost any opportunity for searching into the marine environment, coming back always wet and muddy from head to toe. The journey, however, has not been all about happy stories. While working as a marine biologist in the field, I started to see how animals I love, my childhood majesties, emerge out dead in fishing nets, or washed ashore dead with a piece of plastic in their stomach. So, although I really enjoyed pure science, seeing these bitter and unfortunate events every day made me upset, angry, and worry about the future. So, I decided to change my mission and work as a marine conservationist instead of just doing pure science. I decided to turn the tide. I founded Qeshm Environmental Conservation Institute, a non-governmental and non-profit marine conservancy working to safeguard marine biodiversity in the Persian Gulf. The journey so far has not been without the struggles. In a country isolated by the world's harshest political sanctions, two years of asking for support went in vain. I remember during those days, every day when I walked through a street with my five-year-old daughter to buy her ice cream, we passed a street vendor that sells fish, including small sharks. The only thing that I could to do was to ask the vendor to allow us to measure sharks. During these moments, my daughter kept asking millions of questions, like, Dad, why are these fish not in the ocean? And because they were mostly small sharks, she asked, Dad, aren't their parents worried about them? These heartbreaking questions that I had no answer for them helped me through that difficult time by reminding me of my mission and not to give up. This persistence finally helped me to find people who work for building a better future instead of investing on the racist policies. And eventually, we started our shark and ray conservation program. And very soon, our efforts began to pay off. We found that just during two months of shrimp fishing season, about 500 trawlers catch about 8,000 tons of rays from Iranian waters, roughly equals to more than 10 million individuals. And that more than half of all ray species we recorded from the area are classified as threatened in the IUCN red list. And that the tentacle butterfly ray, a species last time recorded in 1986, believed possibly to be extinct, comprises more than 15% of total ray bycatch by Iranian trawlers. All these findings showed that rays need urgent attention along Iranian waters. And we have now mobilized a very influential group of policymakers, local fishers, professional scientists, and motivated volunteer students to help these amazing creatures reach a positive abundance trend, especially in the context of mitigating bycatch mortality. Now, Future for Nature Award provides me a great opportunity to go to the field and work with the folks to reduce bycatch mortality of threatened species in the Persian Gulf. But I believe the greatest opportunity that Future for Nature provides me is you. People who I can share them my story and bring their attention to the unique marine biodiversity of the Persian Gulf. Know that a tiny microbe has been isolating us and we have met up virtually kilometers far from each other. It reminds me of very sobering facts. That because of the wrong choices we made in the past, we humans are now at the brink of an uncertain future. 
but in the end, the only way for changing the situation is again us, we humans, not me, not you, all of us. If we all together decide to live responsibly, we will be able to sustain future and pass it to our children in a healthy and safe form. Thank you. Thank you, Mohsen. That was just wonderful. It's been such a pleasure to hear all of your fascinating stories. And thank you all so much for what you do. I have been very moved to hear how each of you has been inspired and motivated by your children and the questions that they've asked. Well, now there's a chance for our audience to dig a little deeper into your lives and ask you some questions in the Q&A. So let's all welcome Monica, Carolina, and Mozen onto the virtual stave, stage where they are joining us live from Guatemala, Chile, and Iran. Hello, there you are. Hello, <laughs> we, we get to see you at last in person. Very exciting. Some of you must have just woken off, and Mozen, you must almost be getting ready for bed. Yes, of course. <laughs> so good. Well, I just wanted to quickly ask you some questions that have been coming up from the audience. Monica, it's an amazing thing to discover a species, rediscover a species. What did it feel like when you refound Abronia cambelli that was thought to be extinct? My first feeling was of a lot of hope, just finding this species and realize that it was still persevering in the wild was great news. But then this feeling was also accompanied by this sense of responsibility. When I realized the extent of habitat loss these species had been subjected to, I felt responsible to do something about it and something you certainly have done. What do you think the key part of your conservation strategy uh, was that has, has made everything work so well? I think there is a couple of things. First is this faith in people's capacity to change and, and improve and to really believe that there is a will inside everyone's to do conservation and take that seriously. And the other thing is to don't be afraid to try new things. In Guatemala, normally conservation takes place in private land and stuff like that. So my approach was very different. People thought it was not going to work because I depended on, on the will of local people. People thought that farmers were not going to be part of their productive land to create these biological corridors, but I proved that wrong. And people also told me that local people will, will never work with a species they fear and that they have these ingrained habits that they will never change. But I also proved that wrong. And it was just by believing in people's will to do conservation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, once people know the facts, then often they see sense. Can you explain to us a little bit more about these biological corridors? What exactly are you planting? And what do you think the key point was that uh, made these farmers and other landowners give up their land for nature conservation? The biological corridors that we are creating are very important because what we are protecting is this small arboreal lizard. And the habitat in some parts is just a remnant of isolated trees. So they are trapped in these little trees that are becoming like islands for them. So the corridors have the power to protect, to create, but also to connect the remaining habitat. 
And these corridors also help to every other biodiversity in the area. And they are also protecting the systems that are providing the environmental services and products for local people. And this is how you can also connect people with nature when they realize that they also are part and they also depend on nature. Of course, for the air we breathe and the water we drink. Your situation makes me think uh, quite a lot also of Carolina, who's, who's dealing with a lot of agriculture. Uh, Carolina, uh, living at the edge of the de desert is difficult both for people and wildlife. You've been helping the people. What have you been doing to help them and how does this help the hummingbirds? In my country, 15% of the population does not um, have direct access to potable water to pipes. And therefore, to have water, trucks must move in container. And this transfer the water from the city to the community of the valleys. Conservation measures must be taught in strategic ways to benefit the species uh, that we seek to protect and deliver it to the community with a low carbon footprint. That is why we have both an atmospheric water uh, generation to ensure the irrigation of plants that will refer it in school and also that students in the community can drink this water too. And, and also to help the plants for the hummingbirds, I would imagine. What is it about the pica flor in comparison to other hummingbirds that you find so special? Mm. The hummingbird, especially uh, Chilean woodster, is very, very tiny. It's, it's a more tiny now here in my country as the 10 species. And it's a very stronger in the territory. Uh, they protect the area. The, it's um, male beautiful. It's very beautiful in, the, in my side, in my valley. The, the ear is very complicated with the people and the hummingbird uh, is the feel the people. It's the difficult life, is uh, difficult for the agriculture expansive and hummingbird stayed in your perching for food. Tiny, but with a lot of character. So I know a few people who are like that. Mozen, on to you now, all the way in Iran. Tell us about the Persian Gulf. Why is it such a interesting and unique ecosystem? Uh, well, uh, the sea surface temperature in the Persian Gulf uh, can vary between uh, 15 to over 36 degrees. And over the millennia, uh, marine species in this sea have evolved to adapt to its uh, extreme temperatures. And uh, Therefore, by studying marine species in the Persian Gulf, we can understand that how man-made global warming may affect uh, marine biodiversity elsewhere in the world. And, and it is why that we marine biologists believe that the most valuable treasure at the heart of, of the Persian Gulf is its unique hit tolerant marine biodiversity with many uh, other people uh, believe that uh, know that the Persian Gulf because of its huge oil and gas resources that uh, provides about one fifth of the petroleum that our civilization consumes. So uh, yeah, I mean, in this crazy world of, of climate heating, we have a lot to learn from Iran, mm -hmm. and we need better communication. Mm -hmm. That brings me on to probably the most difficult question. What is the biggest challenge for a nature conservationist uh, working in Iran um, in the current political landscape? Uh, the biggest challenge is uh, political sanctions uh, that uh, have continued even uh, during the novel uh, COVID pandemic and not only affect the life of millions of people, but also 
uh, many uh, threatened habitats and species. Um, and uh, when the growing poverty forced the people to invade the environment and uh, start to engage to uh, illegal activities like overfishing and pollution. But I believe that uh, in, in our global uh, village, we people there who love each other uh, as a, a part of the same human family, uh, uh, we are at the majority, and uh, we just need to stand together against uh, this unlawful operation. And uh, I think that it is the the only way that we can end the cycle of uh, of environmental uh, destruction and the poverty. And uh, then we, we can help to build a better future for nature, not only in Iran, but in all the developing nations. I think all of you have said that one way or the other. A cooperation is absolutely essential if we're going to solve the problems that we face as a species. Well, thank you all so much. It's really very interesting to hear your answer to these questions. Um, and I would just like to thank you all again once more on behalf of the Future for Nature team, who are just all so happy to meet you today. Well, now we have our special guest beaming in live from Santa Cruz, California. Hello, France. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. <laughs> and uh, greetings to all of you from uh, the West Coast of North America. And um, I'm so happy to join you here. And I am so impressed by your, not just by your energy and your commitment, <laughs> but also by the ingenuity of all the conservation solutions that you're working on. So uh, blessings to all of you and much strength because you're going to need it in the years ahead. Thank you and so much. now Thank you. Uh, to continue, uh, sorry, did you want to say anything, Saba? Okay. So again, I'm so happy to, uh, to join you here and uh, but now continuing with the program, um, I would like to introduce a few other people who would like to say a few words. Are you all there? Yes. The Monica, for the premio que se ha ganado, que Dios la cuide, la bendiga siempre que salga adelante, que luche siempre por Monica, it has been a great pleasure and a blessing for me to work with and learn from you and to get to know you as my daughter. This award and recognition, no one deserves it more, and I know he agrees. Congratulations, and I'll see you soon, and I send you a big hug. Monica, nuestras felicitaciones por el premio Future for Nature. Gracias por trabajar por un futuro mejor para todos. Gracias. Carolina, un orgullo haber sido tu profesor, un gran orgullo trabajar en la ONG Pica Federica y también tener estos, estas evidencias del trabajo de nuestros estudiantes a través del concurso Un breve relato para el Pica Federica. Mucho cariño de mi parte. Carolina, muchas felicidades y muchas gracias por todo el trabajo que realizas. Hemos aprendido mucho de ti en la organización y seguro vamos a conseguir muchas más cosas por el Picaflor de Arica. Carolina recibe las felicitaciones y un gran abrazo por haber logrado este, este premio, este prestigioso premio. Y eres una inspiración para todos nosotros, sobre todo para seguir trabajando con el Picaflor de Arica, que es una maravillosa ave del desierto de Chile. Carola, eh, amiga, me siento muy afortunada y feliz de compartir este gran logro junto a ti, orgullosa de tu profesionalismo y toda la dedicación que le hace a esta gran obra, tu ONG Pica Flor de Ica. Dear Mosen, it's great to see how far you've come from being a captain of frogs to a conservation hero of the Persian Gulf. Congratulations, my friend, on being a Future for Nature Award winner 2021. Dear Mosen, Kari. Congratulations, dear Mosen. I'm sure nothing can stop you. I hope 
you'll be always free and sharp, like rays and sharks. <laughs> Dear Mozen, I and the children are proud of you. Being the Future for Nature Award, congratulations. You deserve the best. Hi, Dad. Congratulations. Oh, well, it's so unfair that I have to speak after that because it always brings me to tears. Well, if there was ever going to be love and congratulations from the people that matter, it's from your teams in the field. What a phenomenal gathering this has been today. And I just also want to thank our wonderful audience for being part of this event through Hopin and watching us also on live stream. Well, well, we hope you'll join us um, either digitally or in person at a Future for Nature award events in the coming years. When, if the world returns to its new normal and it's safe to travel again, we will be inviting all of today's winners and all of last year's winners to the Netherlands to receive their awards in person, hopefully at our 15th award event next year. Well, if there's one thing COVID has taught us, it's that we are all connected, not just as humans, but all species that make up the interdependent fabric of life. So what happens elsewhere in the world really matters. And that is why we must all link arms today to preserve and enrich our delicate and beautiful biosphere and these species uh, that we have been learning about. These young heroes have shown us examples of what each of us can do as individuals, how to open our eyes and our hearts from the questions of innocent children, how to make the right choices and do what needs to be done. Even if we can't be out there with them, rolling up our sleeves by their side, we can, as France said, nourish the small saplings, nourish the roots and help them grow into the great redwoods in their full and magnificent extent. So please do join hands with Future for Nature today. Become part of this wonderful movement and support its superlative efforts. Your donations will go directly to the next generation of nature conservation heroes, and it will really make a difference. Well, in a moment, the program on this main stage will come to an end. After the final video, we invite all of you on Hopin to come and join the winners in their private session rooms. Um, you'll see all of the rooms pop up in a few minutes to the left of your screen. Or you can just stay here on the main stage, um, visit the field sites of the previous winners in the ex ex uh, exposition hall, or meet the other attendees using the personal chat function to the right. And now to close, here are some final words from our wonderful Future for Nature family of laureates. Goodbye. Hello everyone uh, at the Future for Nature Awards. My name is Iro Tanji. My name is Dr. Lucy King. My name is Maria Fernanda Puerto Carrillo. Hello from Australia. My name is Maggie. I am Elsa Laviren. My name is Olivia Nsegimana. I'm Samia Sai. My name is Caleb Ofori Boatin. Fariza Farhan. Vitsa van der Werf. This is Ophir. I am Mohamed Fahad Hagini. My name is Bronwyn Marie, and I'm from South Africa. Inza Kundi. My name is Fernanda but I'm from Brazil. And today I'm crossing the Amazon River to get to a highway and work there. My work consists in community empowerment for the conservation of four of the most endangered primates of West Africa. From the fight against wildlife crime in Africa. My work focuses on protecting the last remaining population of the Togo slippery frog in Ghana. In uh, Morocco, on Barbary macaques. I work to save the endangered grey crown of prince in Rwanda. Today is an important day because my son, Monica, and Carolina are joining the Future for Nature family. A big congratulations to the 2021 Future for Nature Award winners, and I'd like to welcome you to our big Future for Nature family. An incredible group of passionate and like-minded conservationists. Secondly, I'd like to say a huge congratulations for all you've achieved so far. I would like to congratulate Mohsen, Monica, and Carolina. Congratulations. Big congratulations. 
I would like to congratulate you. And really well done on all your hard work um, for the conservation of the endangered species that you're working with. I wish Carolina, Mohsen and Monica a big congratulation for their amazing work. Uh, by winning this award, you'll find that your important conservation work is really going to get a massive boost. And we wish you the best of luck with your work. I just want to tell you guys to enjoy the moment, enjoy every emotion of this award and welcome to the family. Welcome to our wonderful Future for Nature family. A wonderful family where you receive friendship, solidarity, proactivity, networking and even a source of motivation. You will love, love, love being part of this family. It's amazing. I look forward to following your career and your growth in the years to come and getting to know you a lot better. Congratulations. I would like to give my congratulations to the new three winners and my warm welcome to our family.